since ancient times preserving the likeness of the great people of a society has been normal busts were commonly made of both the living and the dead to honour them they are commonly found today in most of the great museums and the great houses in particular of europe the question is how did sculptors know what the deceased looked like in order to produce lifelike representations of the people in marble or bronze in Europe, since the Middle Ages, a plaster cast would be taken of the dead person's face, and this used by the artist to produce a lifelike and accurate sculpture or bust. The practice probably grew out of the Romans, using wax impressions to preserve the features of dead family members, which were then used to produce the lifelike marble busts we are all familiar with today. And now, a brief word from our sponsor. Ever noticed if you Google some product and then you start receiving spam emails about similar products? This is because your information is being sold or published online without you knowing about it. You would be shocked by just how much of your personal information is held by data brokers who sell it to all sorts of companies. So your data can be easily sold to scammers, including your financial data, leaving you and your family at risk. Your name, social security number, home address, location history, online activity, all this and more can be purchased by businesses and could also fall into the hands of criminals. Incogni can put an end to this problem. How? You create an account and tell Incogni whose personal data you want removing. Incogni works for you and will contact the data brokers while you kick back, keeping you updated on Incogni's progress every step of the way. Use the code Mark Felton in the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Incogni, protecting your personal data. In the case of the leaders or prominent personages of Nazi Germany, death masks were taken for a couple of reasons. Either to preserve the features for some future permanent bust, or for medical forensic reasons following their deaths. One of the first Nazi-era death masks we know about was that of Reich President Paul von Hindenburg, who died in August 1934, some 20 months into Hitler's chancellorship of Germany. Hindenburg was a colossal figure in modern German history. During World War I, he commanded the Kaiser's armies and won several important battles, notably his crushing of the Russians at Tannenberg in August 1914. A massive personality cult grew up around him, and though he failed to win World War I for his emperor, he nonetheless remained a highly respected post-war figure. In 1925, Hindenburg became president of the Weimar Republic, and in January 1933, reluctantly agreed to the appointment of Hitler as chancellor. Unfortunately, he abetted the Nazi plans to turn Germany into a one-party police state by signing two important pieces of legislation into law. The February 1933 Reichstag Fire Decree, which suspended many civil liberties, and the Enabling Act of 1933, giving Hitler's regime emergency powers that they never returned. Hindenburg was the last block on Hitler's taking complete control of German politics, and by summer 1934, the old field marshal was becoming alarmed by the behaviour of the Nazis. When he attempted to address the people via Vice-Chancellor Franz von Papen, calling for an end to state terror and a restoration of some civil liberties, Propaganda Minister Dr Goebbels intervened, preventing the recorded speech being broadcast on the radio and seizing any newspaper that dared print any of it. By now Hindenburg, at 86 years old, was battling lung cancer. Once Hitler knew Hindenburg was on his deathbed, he had the cabinet pass the law concerning the head of state of the German Reich that stipulated that upon Hindenburg's death, the office of president would be abolished and its power merged with that of chancellor to create a new title for Hitler, Führer und Reichskanzler, leader and chancellor of the Reich. Hindenburg died on the 2nd of August 1934 and this death mask was quickly taken. He was buried with great ceremony at the Tannenberg Memorial, built in 1924 at Hohenstein in East Prussia, now in Poland. In 1945, as the Red Army approached Hohenstein, Hitler ordered the body of Hindenburg to be saved, and it ended up secreted in a salt mine in Germany, where it was captured by the Americans, along with the bodies of Emperor Wilhelm I, 
and King Frederick II, better known, of course, as Frederick the Great. Hindenburg then spent months in storage at Marburg Castle until the Americans had him and his wife laid to rest in August 1946 at St. Elizabeth's, a Teutonic church at Marburg, where they lie today. The death mask was made by sculptor Josef Torak, famous for his oversized monumental sculptures. The Austrian Torak would prosper greatly under the Nazis, including spending several days with Hitler at Orbesalzberg in preparation for making a bust of the Führer. In 1941, he joined the Nazi party, and Goebbels praised him as, quote, our greatest sculptural talent, end quote. His studio was designed for him by Albert Speer. The death mask provided a guide from which Torak created this monumental bust of Hindenburg. During the Nazi era, Hindenburg's death mask was displayed in a glass case in the Hall of Fame in the Zeughaus, the old Berlin armory. It was saved from destruction during World War II and is now on public display at the German Historical Museum in Berlin. The assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, the Nazi chief in German-occupied Czechoslovakia during 1942, is one of the most controversial events of the war. Not controversial for the assassination, but for the bloodbath that followed it as German security forces took revenge on the Czech people. Heydrich's reign of terror from his headquarters at Prague Castle came to an abrupt end on the 27th of May 1942, when his open-top Mercedes-Benz limousine was ambushed by a Czech and a Slovak special operations executive agent, parachuted into Czechoslovakia by the British for the express purpose. Heydrich was wounded by hand grenade fragments and subsequently died of blood poisoning in hospital on the 4th of June 1942. This death mask was taken off him to be turned into a bronze bust, and his funeral in Prague and Berlin was a major display of Third Reich pomp and ceremony. In the wake of his death, Himmler's SS avenged him through the massacre of villagers falsely linked to resistance groups. Overall, some 1,300 Czechoslovaks were killed in barbaric reprisals. Many questions were asked by the Allies, including the Czech government in exile in London, as to whether the cost in human lives had been worth it. And no further assassinations of senior Nazis were attempted during the rest of the war. Heydrich was buried in full SS general's uniform, including with his honor sword, which was most probably Heinrich Himmler's, as it was the fashion at the time for the senior man to exchange his sword with his dead subordinate. Though his elaborate grave was destroyed post-war by the Soviets, he is still buried at the Invalidenhof in Berlin. In December 2019, some persons unknown attempted to dig him up, probably after the sword, and perhaps other things such as medals and decorations. See the description for my video about this fascinating subject. As for the Heydrich death mask, it was created by sculptor Franz Rotter, and several bronze busts were produced from it on Himmler's express order. But the original plaster death mask was most probably destroyed during the war. Each bronze Heydrich bus cost 4,000 Reichsmarks, and they were displayed in various places. One, for example, was in Himmler's Berlin office, another at his special castle at Wivelsburg. Lena Heydrich, Heydrich's widow, post-war ran an inn on the Baltic island of Fermann and displayed a life-size bronze of her husband quite openly on the wall. After her death in 1985, the bronze bust must have passed to one of her four children, who have it now. The death of another German officer also witnessed a huge state funeral attended by Hitler. The death of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the famous Desert Fox. Widely respected even today by his former enemies, Rommel earned his extraordinary reputation in the Western Desert in North Africa in 1941-42, when his understrength and often ill-equipped Africa Corps and Germany's Italian allies turned the tide against the British Empire in a series of brilliant victories that brought Hitler's armies almost to the Suez Canal in Egypt, the vital communications and transit link in the British Empire. Though Rommel was eventually forced back at the Second Battle of El Alamein in 1942, his reputation as a brilliant general and a decent man was set in stone. No Nazi, 
though in the early period rommel had actually commanded hitler's military escort unit he managed to keep most of the worst criminal aspects of the wartime german state out of his north african theatre where his enemies were largely treated with honour and respect though it has emerged subsequently that he was less successful in preventing himmler's ss from dealing with north africa's small jewish communities Rommel later commanded an army during the Battle of Normandy in 1944, but by now was becoming critical of Hitler and began to involve himself with the growing anti-Hitler resistance movement that spread in the German army. Rommel was badly injured when his staff car was strafed in Normandy, and while convalescing at home in Germany, the July bomb plot failed to eliminate Hitler. During the roundups that followed, an officer named Rommel during a torture session, and Hitler decided to get rid of the Desert Fox. The problem was, Rommel was a national hero, and due to his humble background, a perfect example of the National Socialist Army hero that the state lauded over the usual assortment of aristocrats that dominated the officer corps of the armed forces. Rommel was given a choice. Either he took the disgraced officer's usual path and took his own life, or faced being hauled before the People's Tribunal, a kangaroo court, to be humiliated and undoubtedly sentenced to a painful death. If he chose the former way out, he was assured that his family would not be touched, and they would receive his field marshal's pension. If he chose court-martial, his wife and son would be arrested and imprisoned in a concentration camp. So it was that Rommel chose to end his life, and he was taken for a short drive in a staff car, accompanied by two generals of Hitler's staff on the 14th of October 1944. And just outside Herlingen, the small town where he lived, he swallowed a cyanide capsule. The public were told that the Desert Fox had died from injuries that he had sustained in the car crash in Normandy. This death mask was taken of Rommel shortly afterwards. The tear-like blobs under his eyes were caused by air bubbles trapped in his eyelids when the cast was removed. Also evident is the dent in his left forehead, a result of the car crash. Rommel had given instructions that his funeral was not to show Nazi imagery, but of course the Nazis ignored this, and his state funeral was an enormous undertaking and a cynical exercise in honouring a man whom it actually turned against the regime and Hitler. The death mask was discovered by troops of the U.S. 7th Army in 1945. It is currently displayed at the German Panzer Museum in Munster, which is fitting due to his amazing use of his limited supply of panzers so successfully in the Desert War. Rommel is buried at Herlingen, a suburb of the city of Ulm. Our last example of a Nazi-era death mask was created not by the Germans, but by the British. Heinrich Himmler, Reichsführer SS, fell into British hands on the 21st of May 1945, as he and a group of SS officers and men were apprehended moving south from his last field headquarters near Flensburg in northern Germany, where Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, the new Reich president, had established his government following Hitler's death in Berlin. I have created a really in-depth series about the death of Himmler that you can find linked in the end screen. Suffice it to say, Himmler was taken to a house at 31A Ulsenerstrasse in British-occupied Lüneburg on the 23rd of May 1945, and there he died, officially of cyanide poisoning. Great mystery surrounds the circumstances of his death, and many official documents remain classified to this day. However, a post-mortem examination of sorts was carried out on the 25th of May and included Colonel Brown and Major Atkins of the Royal Army Dental Corps. Following examination of the body by British Army pathologist Dr. Bond, Brown and Atkins made a detailed chart of Himmler's teeth, seen here. And then they made two latex casts of Himmler's face, apparently without being ordered to do so. One cast, this one, was sent to General Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters, and the other was retained by Colonel Brown. In later life, Brown donated his Himmler death mask to the Army Medical Services Museum, where it is currently on display. It contains interesting evidence concerning the state of Himmler's face at the time of his death, which has led some to challenge the official story of death by cyanide poisoning. 
The mask face has been said to show signs of damage, more consistent with having been beaten when alive, shortly before his death. The details of the mask are much more clearly shown in these photographs, taken of the mask that was sent to General Eisenhower, now on display at the Imperial War Museum in London. Both masks contain evidence that may yet help to solve the mystery of the Reichsfuhrer's strange end. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.